if you are watching this, I have COVID. Now, because this is pre-recorded, I feel a little bit weird about doing a prayer, which I'd normally do before the sermon. So I trust that our faithful ministers have that part in hand. Last week, we heard from Carol's tapestry of faith and our dear David, who interviewed her, kind of highlighted a couple of times the fact that Carol is now moving on from her role as Epworth House manager and into the next chapter of her story of life and vocation. This is important to recognize, but I couldn't help think to myself, what about us? What about this community of Leichhardt Uniting Church? Carol's leaving this role heralds also the next chapter of our life and vocation and ministry. We will turn the spotlight to Carol during this service, but I propose here now that we turn the spotlight to ourselves. The imperative for us as we ask ourselves what's next is to remind ourselves who we are, what we believe and what our vocation is. Now, I can't do that, um, especially in one sermon. However, what I can offer and what I propose to do today is to illuminate something of the defining theology of this community. That is radical Christocentric discipleship, which has been the raison d'etre of Epworth House and its mission to support discipleship formation of young adults. We've heard from the Gospel of Mark this morning, and it's appropriate that we take up this text today, this Gospel story of Mark. Why? Because Mark is the most powerful discipleship text in the entire Bible. It has a long history of use in our community. And the commentary I draw on today is from Ched Myers. Footnote one, finding the strong man. Or if you're not that into torturously long theological manifestos, I refer you to the easy reading footnote 1a, say to this mountain. Let's turn now to our Markham text. And I do mean literally. If you have a Bible in front of you for this sermon, you're going to get a lot out of it because I'm going to refer frequently to the text. While you do, let's orient ourselves a little bit to the world of Mark. Now, you've probably heard that Bible texts are like a photograph. They're a snapshot in time of a particular people, a particular place, a particular time. And I find this photograph idea is a really handy way of approaching Bible texts. But the Gospel of Mark is less like a photograph and really more like a portrait. Yes, we need to know the time, the place, the people, the culture. That's essential in Mark. But the elements of the story, the narrative construction, the literary devices that Mark uses, it's also carefully constructed for a particular purpose. That's one of the things I love about Mark. It's so short and yet so incisive. Every little detail is there for a reason. Each has a meaning, a message, a purpose. It's rich with instruction, illumination, condemnation, conviction, and the biggest C word of them all. Yes, conversion. It's also the earliest gospel, the first gospel to have been recorded, and it's estimated to have been written as early as 55 ACE. Now, just think about that for a minute. 55 ACE. That's really only about 20 years after Jesus died. <clears throat> now, am I making the point here that it's the first gospel and therefore it's the best gospel? Well, that would be like arguing that Adam was the best because God made him first and Eve was just the second best. When really, we know that Adam was God's version 1.0 and Eve was God's version 2.0. Just kidding. We all know that Adam and Eve were formed simultaneously out of Ha Adam, the non-binary earth creature. Footnote two, God and the Rhetoric of Sexuality by Phyllis Tribble. But think seriously about it. The gospels of Matthew and Luke have been dated around 85 to 90. 
and John around 90 to 110. That's generations after Jesus. Mark's gospel was while Jesus' life, death and resurrection was still fresh in people's memory. Eyewitnesses to Jesus were still alive and Mark probably made use of their testimony in his writing. Mark contains detail that was likely embarrassing or unnerving to the later and more evolved Christian communities. These details have been curiously omitted in the later Gospels. Things like a bumbling two-part healing miracle. Come on Jesus, you can do it. Or Jesus using his fingers to invade someone's facial orifices. Um, gross. Or my favourite episode, where Jesus is described as mad and his family tries to restrain him. Awkward. Isn't he supposed to be meek and mild and of sane mind? In Mark, Jesus is presented as a stunning and remarkable figure. There are no cultural accommodations, no beating around the bush with Mark's Jesus. In verse 1, Mark announces something dramatic right off the bat. Verse 1, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Whoa there, Mark. Two terms here would have been very familiar to his audience. The word gospel and the opening line, the beginning. Let's address the beginning. Now, we often failed to appreciate that the Old Testament was Jesus' Bible. It was also Mark's Bible. And in fact, it wasn't even a testament. It just was. And Mark's mostly Jewish readership, oh, they knew their Bibles. And the beginning, well, that's the first line of their Bible, Genesis 1.1. What's Mark doing? He's implying that he is out to reclaim and renew the creation story. People would have been sitting up and paying attention, if not a little bit scandalized. And in case you were wanting to give Mark the benefit of the doubt, and like just shrug off his opening line as a sort of overzealous marketing tactic to get people to read his little book. Well, think again. He goes even further in verse 2 when a spooky offstage voice starts reciting the Hebrew scriptures as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. And not just any part of scripture, it's Isaiah and a reopening of the way. This is a direct reference to the foundational narrative of Israel, the Exodus journey of liberation. Those with your Bibles open can take a sneaky little flip to Exodus 23, 20 for a bonus thrill. In Mark's story, the way will become synonymous with discipleship. Just as Israel followed the angel in the wilderness, so we will be invited to follow Jesus. You really, really need to understand the Exodus story to appreciate what Jesus is attempting to achieve, and by proxy, understanding the nature of your own discipleship. Footnote three, the prophetic imagination by Walter Brueggemann. We don't have time for that today. Brueggemann will help you. Back to Mark, we've dealt with the beginning. Now let's talk about his second term that would have been familiar to his readership, the word gospel or as it is rendered in our trusty NRSVs, the good news. Mark's era was a time of Roman occupation and gospel was a type of Roman propaganda. News of military victories or the ascension to power of a new emperor was referred to as gospel. In contrast, Mark offers decidedly non-imperial good news about Jesus of Nazareth. How subversive! He challenges the imperial myth claiming that the way of Jesus is the only way of true benefit to humanity. Well, I don't know about you, but this gives me the chills. It's only verse one, and Mark has obliterated any consideration that Christian discipleship involves maintaining the status quo, or that it's just a private individual faith. It's sedition, and it's not bloody safe as what it is. In his very first sentence, Mark is giving the finger to the imperial occupiers. Now, if you were a minority living under military occupation, would you be doing this? No. Um, why? Because you don't want to die. But Mark is getting right out there. He's making a political statement against the oppressive empire. He knows that. And the way of Jesus is, as we learn from Mark, 
the way of the cross. Now let's check in. Yes, I'm still only on verse one, but Mark's just really that good. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna skip ahead to verses 16 to 20, knowing that there is a lot still to be mined. <clears throat> there are three call to discipleship episodes that drive the major plot line of Mark. The first one is in verses 16 to 20, and it contains these two almost identical call narratives. Here, Jesus chooses his students in a rather odd way. Let's look at the text. Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee. He's in motion. He's not stopping or waiting around. And what happens? He sees Simon and his brother. He sees them working and he calls out to them. And he says something weird about fishing for people. This line about making them fish for people was cute because they were literally fishing but it was also a reference to a number of Old Testament descriptions of people as fish in the context of meeting out justice in situations of perverted power and privilege. This invitation to dismantle and overturn the structures of power and privilege in the world is how Jesus advertised what following him meant to the first disciples. No recitations of John 3.16 to be seen, no requirement that they admire him, no expectation of a silent retreat or a degree from a reputable theological college. What comes to mind when you think about what it means to be a Christian, a disciple of Christ? What do you think it means to people in our wider society? And how does that compare to what Jesus puts to these, the first disciples, about his mission. The next thing that happens is that these men immediately leave their work and follow Jesus. There's no, I'll think it over. There's no Q and A. There's not even a goodbye to their family. Verse 18, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. Afiyami is the Greek word for left, as in left their nets. And I think it's so beautiful that this verb, afiemi, means to release. It's a jubilee verb that means to release someone from financial debt and sin and even demons. Afiemi is an allusion to the discipleship community's practice of social and economic redistribution. The call to discipleship for those first disciples and for us requires more than just a scent of the heart. The call invites us to weave a new social fabric, to live in a different way, to cultivate a new economy in the fullest sense of the word. One aspect of these call narratives that I find so enlivening is that Jesus comes to us. We don't have to do anything to seek him. He's right there, reaching out to us in the most banal, the most ordinary, and the most unspiritual parts of our lives. He sees us even when we might feel invisible. The call requires unqualified obedience, and I can't under understate this. These call narratives stand in stark contrast to what the original reader's cultural expectations about how rabbis take on new acolytes. I mean, Luke, who I earlier suggested had smoothed out some of Mark's gospel, um, he really rams this down the reader's throats. In Luke 9.62, Jesus is described as fielding several discipleship inquiries from would-be followers. These potentials all provide caveats to Jesus. First, let me bury my father. First, let me say goodbye to my family. All totally reasonable requests and expected requests within their cultural frame. But Jesus' reply to these requests, it's uncompromising. He says, quote, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, to say he was not trying to ingratiate his potential followers is a bit of an understatement. This is a smackdown of the highest order. Look, you might be puzzled by the plow reference, I know I was. Is this Jesus being a bit cryptic? 
Um, perhaps he's using a soft but slightly bizarre bucolic metaphor to shrug off these well-meaning but ultimately pathetic would-be disciples. Sadly, no. Those of you following along with your Bibles might like to flip to 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 19 to 21. This is the archetypal Old Testament call narrative. The prophet Elijah calls Elisha. And can you guess what Elisha is doing when Elijah comes by to call him? Yeah, he's plowing a field. And do you know what else happens? He asks Elijah if he can go and say goodbye to his parents first. And Elijah says, of course you can. This is a big deal, take your time. Elisha then proceeds to not only say his goodbyes, but tie up all his affairs before he goes on and follows Elijah. This is what the audience would have been expecting from Jesus, but Jesus shocks them. Back to Mark now, and what we have here is in these short call narratives, Jesus invading people's workplaces and requiring them to immediately get up and go. Accepting the call for these disciples represented not only the loss of their and their family's economic security, it was a tear in the social fabric of the extended family, and as a consequence, a tear in the very fabric of society itself. So far, we've only talked about men, and it would be remiss of me to do a sermon on Mark and not at least point out that the male disciples, who are the main characters, repeatedly behave in ways that fall short of what Jesus expects. They're actually used as a literary foil to accentuate the women's faithful discipleship. In Mark 1, 31, we have the first woman entering the story, Simon's mother-in-law, so a woman who doesn't even have her own name. She's described as being healed and then serving Jesus and the disciples. Well, she probably made them tea and scones and then submissively cowered in the presence of their greatness, right? Well, maybe, but probably not. Because what we do know is that this verb, to serve, diakonia, the same word that we derive the word deacon from, only appears two more times in Mark's Gospel. The next time it appears, in chapter 10, verse 35, Jesus is in the thick of a pretty stern lecture to the disciples who are jostling amongst themselves about who will have the most power, who's going to have the best cabinet positions in Jesus' government. Jesus, poor guy, he's a bit weary, he's a bit exasperated with the disciples who just fail to get it again and again, and Jesus gives it to them straight. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to... Diakonia, to serve, and to give his life in a ransom for many. To serve, to serve. In Mark, it is women who demonstrate the quality of servanthood, of leadership, in fact, advanced here by Jesus, as the very methodology of his whole mission. Now, is Mark implying that in a patriarchal system, it's only women who are fit to exercise leadership? That would be a subversive proposition indeed. I'll leave it to you to consider. Regardless, Mark clearly portrays the women in a society that devalued them as the true disciples. I mentioned earlier three call to discipleship events in Mark. Today I will mention the second in 834, Jesus conditions the discipleship. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wants to become my follower, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Three verbs, deny, take up and follow. I'll make just a couple of points about these verbs. The first and most important point for us is that these three verbs, when considered in the context of Mark's Gospel, are not about denying one's own needs and experience. They do not refer to some shouldering of personal burdens and carrying on in the hope of heavenly rewards. What a load of BS! Self-love and other love, two inexorably linked activities, have pride of place in the kingdom. 
Jesus is talking about self-denial here, as the idea that one's self is not the centre of the universe. He's calling us out of a life centred in individualism, self-interest, and into a life according to God's love. Further, when Jesus says, take up the cross, He's talking quite literally about the state's weapon of execution. He's saying that discipleship has physical and political implications. He's saying that the activity of following him, of living an all-encompassing love, will pose a serious threat to the entrenched powers, and the powers will fight back. We have grace from God. Yes, we have Jesus reaching out to us without us having to lift a finger. We're included in God's family, we're forgiven, we have a place in the life-giving community alternative to the structures of domination and oppression. The myth of redemptive violence is no more. Footnote five, Walter Wink, Engaging the Powers. But the grace we have is not cheap. It demands gratitude. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, footnote six, The Cost of Discipleship, has something to say about cheap grace. He reminds us that cheap grace is like forgiveness without repentance, like baptism without church discipline. And coming back to Mark's gospel and what we've learned so far, there is no cheap grace to be found. There is a call, there is wholehearted obedience, there is a decentering of self, there is the way. To the cross. We heard a snippet of 1 John read to us today, chapter 1, verse 6. By this we may be sure that we are in Jesus. Whoever says, I abide in him, ought to walk just as he walked. This letter of 1 John, and this verse in particular, has been Carol's benchmark for life and faith. Carol doesn't care if people don't like her. Carol isn't concerned with money, status, position, or reputation. She tries hard not to be anyway. A large part of her effort has been supported by this church community who has held true to the gospel and who does not allow her to indulge in cheap grace. How are we as a community and personally continuing to hold true to the gospel illustration of discipleship? In what ways might we be cheapening grace and smoothing out the gospel message? And how are we continuing to prioritise discipleship formation of that very important group of young adults and indeed all ages? For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God beyond us, for the word of God that calls us forth. Thanks be to God.